This is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Patrick Briscoe. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, Father Patrick, we're going to do something which we don't ordinarily do in God's Planning episodes. We're going to break the fourth wall. And I'm going to turn to our executive producer, Father Joseph Anthony Cress, and ask, when does this particular episode air? And then we're going to wait on Father Joseph Anthony Cress, who will then tell us that this episode airs August 10th. August 10th. And then we're going to tell our audience that it's live. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> just kidding. We are recording just a little bit before August 10th. So at August 10th, you and I will actually be in Brevard, North Carolina on the men's retreat, which is awesome. So pray for us if you're listening to this on or around the date of drop. Um, but during these summer months, people typically think in terms of Summer recreation, you go to the lake, you might, as you and Father Bonaventure are wont to do, involve yourself in boats and boating. Um, or some other people do things that smell worse, like smoke marijuana. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that is going in the God's Finding Hall of Fame of transitions. <laughs> that is one of the best ones we've had for a while. I was thinking of this recently when my, my parents visited D.C. Uh, this past fall. So I guess it wasn't that recently. But I, I was thinking... <laughs> recently about my mother's comments during that visit so as to clarify yeah. how i'm using yeah. that adverb and what what exactly it's modifying it's uh -huh. modifying my thought not their visit okay got that cleared up <laughs> moving on uh and we're walking around the city of washington dc and if you don't live near a city on the east coast maybe this isn't a phenomenon you've encountered recently but we were walking along the roadside and my mother from northern indiana said it smells like a skunk died <laughs> What died? And mom was earnestly annoyed that public works had not been out to remove an animal carcass. Wow. At which point I said, mom, that's not a skunk. <laughs> Something far more nefarious. Yeah, I appreciated my mother's indignation, though, because when you live in the city, you, for, you forget. Yeah, yeah. If you're surrounded by it, it, it quickly becomes part of part of the scenery, part of the setting, right? It's just, it's just the literally the air we breathe. Uh, it's just part of the setting of living in the city now that you would smell that particularly pungent odor and not think twice about it because you smell it all the time. So it takes someone who is not used to it and is rightly indignant about it to call it to your attention, right? Yeah. Um, so I so I wanted to start this episode by saying maybe this isn't something that you've thought about because it's not something that you encounter. But for those of us that are living in cities especially places where marijuana has been decriminalized or even legalized. The distinction there is minimal and pretty insignificant, if you ask me. But uh, it, it's worth talking about because it's affecting so many spheres of, of public and civic life. Yeah. So that's what, that's what I would say. Yeah, and I think, too, there's a kind of general tendency, it seems, in the United States in the 21st century towards legalization or decriminalization writ large. Um, so there's, yeah, just to kind of push and we're trying to reflect upon it as a polity. I don't know how well we're doing that or how well we're hosting the conversation. So this too could be part of hosting that conversation just to try to make a determination about a substance, which is debatably good or bad. Um, you, it might be fixed in your mind. It was probably fixed in many of the minds of our listeners as to whether it is good or bad. Uh, but still, you know, on the public level, it's debatable. And so I think it's good to be able to have these types of conversations so that we, can yeah form the habits for for hosting these types of conversations because I think that's what that's what politics or that's what civil life is supposed to be about is having good conversations about things that matter so that you can come to something like a consensus or at the very least a working solution. Okay, so when talking about marijuana, we've we've already referenced the main um, kind of targets, as it were, of the public debate. One would be personal consumption. And then the other would be legalization or decriminalization. So maybe we just think about personal consumption first, and then we can gesture towards the latter issue at the end. So when somebody says, you know, marijuana, it's just that not that bad, where do you typically start in your response or how do you typically direct that conversation? Right. So one of the things that you hear people say, it's not that bad. One of the things that they address immediately is a kind of practical use, a medical use, right? Mm -hmm. Like they indicate how substances are used to control pain under the supervision of physicians, which in you know, which at the beginning of a conversation, right, you hear you hear that and you think, okay, you know, we've we've got some kind of medical authority overlooking a controlled substance. And if it's helping someone who is suffering, immediately any person with any kind of compassion 
um, begins to be sensitive to the suffering of the other person and, and would be more open-minded perhaps to, to various ways to alleviate that suffering, right? So if marijuana or other, or other uh, marijuana-based products can help alleviate the suffering of people who have cancer, I think most Americans are going to be interested in that debate. And then you have the, the kind of broader cultural phenomenon. Um, you know, we're talking in terms of personal use. So separate from a medical use would be just a recreational use. Mm -hmm. People saying, well, modern life uh, involves so many pressures. You know, we've got more kids who are more anxious than ever before. Mm -hmm. You know, I've experienced that directly in the classroom or in my other work with young people um, and still experience it regularly in the confessional say, wow, we've got this society that is really stressed out. People are just so stressed out. And yeah. they, they need outlets, they need assistance um, in releasing and alleviating that stress. And if uh, access to a controlled substance can help alleviate the pressures of modern life, then we should think of that and innovate through marijuana or marijuana-based products in order to help address people's anxiety. Mm -hmm. So those, those would be the two places where where uh, I've heard people start the conversation saying, well, they could envision either medical use or a kind of personal recreation use because the demands of life are just so heavy and people need to people need to lay down those demands of living. Yeah. And I think there are some people who make those types of arguments in good faith. They're right. just thinking right. about this issue or they're just thinking about that issue and they do see it as a workable solution to attain to whatever end that they've described. But I also think there are people who do that perhaps in bad faith, you, you know, you can't make that judgment insofar as you don't have access to the interior life of your anonymous interlocutor. But there are some people who are just trying to get the door open so they can stick their foot in the door and then they can swing the door open later. Um, so this would be like, you sometimes see this in the abortion, the abortion debate. People will say, well, what about cases of rape and incest, which are less than 1% of cases in which an abortion is sought. But usually if you were to legalize in whatever, you know, like whatever pertinent situation, if you were to legalize abortion for rape and incest, it's going to be universally available in short order, maybe limited to, you know, the first trimester, but but still, it's headed in that direction. It seems like everything was headed in a worse direction up until very recently when it was repealed, and it's like, oh my gosh, I have to reevaluate the way that I think about this. Um, okay, so good, good, yeah, to kind of start from that vantage. Um, and I think that a lot of people in those contexts, they'll point to the alleviation of pain, the experience of peace, or of mild euphoria. But what you often don't hear described in those conversation are the negative side effects um, of marijuana use. So I don't know if you have favorite negative side effects that you like to highlight in these conversations. Maybe we can start with those. Well, I mean, obviously the fact that it's much more addictive than tobacco. I think that that needs that needs to be said, right? Because everyone wants to pretend that you're free from a substance until, in fact, you realize one day the substance is actually controlling you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I so I think that the demand for use needs to be needs to be really considered and seriously discussed. Um, I think another another great concern is um, is the the fact that regulation makes it very hard um, to realize how controlled or not a, a dose is, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so so it, now in some places that would be countered by people who are moving towards regulation, right? Um, so so that would address that would address this particular concern that there are different strains that that have far more. Um, impactful or far more dangerous side effects right and if we can if we can if we can root those out by by controlling substances then we can provide a safer a safer use experience for everyone um but i'm but i'm i'm not sure that necessarily follows yeah so uh we you know like we have to beg off at the outset and say that we're not experts when it comes to the medical considerations it's the type of thing you know we can kind of read up about it about like on the internet but we're not going to acquit ourselves too terribly admirably in the medical scene but from kind of basic research, it seems like the general tendency of marijuana is that it's getting more and more potent. You'll see some people who will say that compared to 40 years ago, there's about 30 times as much THC in marijuana, like recreationally available marijuana, than there was in yesteryear. Um, and that you made reference to addictive quality. So THC, in addition, you know, it's, it's carcinogenic, so it's more carcinogenic than smoking cigarettes, you know, adjusting for other pertinent factors. Uh, and then there are also these negative side effects, which some people, you know, have vague notions that they're out there saying, but which are documented, which are proven that it, in addition to, in some cases, producing peaceable or otherwise euphoric feelings can also produce just the opposite, like paranoia, for instance, mm -hmm. or like, um, yeah, brain abnormalities 
or like, I'm just going to take a quick look at a couple of things that I wrote down. So like anxiety, psychosis, you'll, you'll, you'll see these things kind of written up. Um, in addition to distorted sense of time, magical thinking, the type of typical high Hollywood actor right. playing a part type right. things. So. I think I also want to say that a lot of the conversation in, uh, in American politics and in American civic order has to do with individual liberty, right? If I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm doing something to myself, it doesn't affect anyone else. Uh, in the case of marijuana use, it does affect a lot of people around you, right? Um, and if we were so militant in outlawing cigarette smoking from public venues, for example, uh, would, would that we would be <laughs> so concerned about the about our public spaces when it comes to marijuana? Um, you know, I started off with the with the anecdote about my mo my mom just noticing how many people in DC smoke publicly, yeah. openly, and it's I find it um, quite intrusive. So I don't think we're actually talking about some of about something that only affects someone in a private sphere of their life. We're actually talking about something that in fact impacts uh, the public uh, square immediately, both in the fact that, you know, I have to encounter what, what it is that you're doing when I walk down the streets of DC, but also these side effects, um, which, uh, which affect different citizens affect the, the body of the whole. Yeah. So far as one, when one suffers, they all suffer. Yep. No. And I think that that's, there, there's a general loosening of the ties that bind us as a civil polity, which is lamentable. And so we think mostly in terms of individual rights and liberties. And so we're loath to say you can't do if it doesn't actually impinge upon me. But this is a clear case, like you said, where it does affect other people. One instance would be um, the correlation between marijuana use and birth defects or hereditary defects in subsequent generations. Um, another would be, you know, like the association of marijuana use and then crime and homelessness. Mm. So this is not causality. It's just to say correlation of a certain sort, but just anecdotal evidence, talking with policemen who work in big cities, uh, they'll tell you, yeah, if there's a kind of paranoic crime committed, uh, of a violent sort, it's usually associated with with marijuana. Um, so again, anecdotal, not hard and fast. We're not making scientific proofs, but things to be taken into account when beginning the conversation. Okay, so an argument that you'll often hear is that it's impossible to like rule against marijuana given that it's basically like alcohol. You know, so what we're talking about here is a natural substance which is, you know, mind altering in some way, shape or form, which people use for medicinal and or recreational purposes to kind of make their way through life. So when people advance an argument along those lines, do you have go-to ways in which you distinguish between alcohol consumption and marijuana use? Yeah, I think here's the part where we can interject a little bit of the moral tradition mm -hmm. in a very helpful way. So alcohol is not sinful um, necessarily by itself, right? Uh, gentle and reasonable and prudent consumption, to use one of your buzzwords, mm -hmm. uh, is a is a, a salutary part of Christian living, right? There's, it's not only is it not wrong, uh, it can help engender conviviality and fraternity amongst a group of friends, right? Um, so in the Catholic moral tradition, alcohol becomes problematic when it uh, precludes someone or inhibits someone in the use of their reason, right? So when is alcohol a sin? Well, when you've had so much that you're actually drunk. Right, that you're not able to exercise clearly your faculties of reason. Um, so something something analogous can be helpful. Something something from that conversation of alcohol can be analogous when we when we're talking about what what is the actual moral difficulty with using marijuana. It's well when you when you get to a point that you're so high that you're not able to use your faculties of reason. Then we have the same the same level of sinfulness, a, gra a grave sin actually. Um, that we would have in excessive alcohol consumption. So I think that's a, that's a helpful place to start so as to give what would be the, what, what I would consider more objective moral shade of the situation. Yeah. Yeah, and I think people will often point out that the point of alcohol isn't to get blitzed, but the point of marijuana is to get stoned. Um, so there's a kind of different logic with which you consume um, and I think that there are telltale signs of that logic that are just kind of built into the substances themselves. So people mm. often say they're both natural. But in the case of alcohol, we're talking about something that is not only natural, but it's comestible, it's nutritive. You know, so like it's something that builds us up. It has calories, uh, but also it has health benefits if you use it well. People often think alcohol, cirrhosis of the liver. That's only if you drink quite a bit for a long time. Um, now, if you are impaired in your judgment from over imbibing and then you get in a car accident, obviously that has negative health effects, but we're talking about something, we're not talking about the same type of effect, like the thing itself is causing this particular effect. 
Yeah. So we're, to that to that point, I just yep. want to give give the example of the guy that did the uh, monastic Lenten beer fast that lost like thirty pounds. Oh yeah, <laughs> after after following the monastic ration of beer, ah, okay. um, which is of course uh, a, a very particular kind of uh, Belgian beer, right? That that is exactly as you're suggesting, nutritive and suffice. So the, on the monastic fast, you abstain from food and go on a liquid diet on beer, basically. Um, anyway, so it it can be a healthy thing when done in moderation. Yeah, yeah, and I think I've forgotten who, but it was. Um, an abbot of a monastery in northwestern Europe during the late 19th, early 20th century who had like a particularly weak stomach and I think was on that fast for any number of years. So a great spiritual author, maybe Blessed Columba Marmion, he looks at the man at the controls who nods. Um, and uh, yeah, so some of these great spiritual works were produced under the, well, not the influence in the negative sense, but were fueled by mm. beer and beer alone. I mean, in the grace of God, but okay. Um, so other other things that I would what I find helpful in making this distinction are that there's a kind of spiritual atmosphere to both substances and they're, they're very different, right? So we think about, you know, in the, in the Christian context, we think about the um, sacramental or like liturgical overtones, especially of wine. Hmm. Um, but we think about it as a kind of entry into life, an invitation to a, a richer form of existence or a higher plane, but not in the sense of escape. Whereas I think our association with marijuana is, is, is typically escape. I'm sure you can engineer the THC or the CBD levels in such a may, in such a way that it gets you to like that precise location that you hope to attain. But again, using the substance in the ordinary fashion, I think it's meant to kind of vacate or to kind of eliminate an experience of humanity. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, I think too that um, I think too that part of part of what we're dealing with is simply recognizing something that's new and on the scene, right? So, I, I think that has to be said um, that that we've not dealt with in the Christian tradition substances like uh, marijuana in this way. Although may, maybe there's something like that with opium and um, convergence of the East, but but I still I still think that's that's fundamentally different. So alcohol resonates in a, in a different way because of the way that it's been appropriated and and moderated in in some ways by the tradition. Yeah, um, and maybe maybe that's a good like jumping off point to approach um, the temperance movement um, because there have been people in the past who have thought that any consumption of alcohol is execrable and that as a result of which it should be banned or outlawed uh, from the civil polity. And our experience as Americans, so prohibition would have lasted from what, like 1919 to 1933, I wanna say, um, 18th Amendment and 21st Amendment. And, but, but when you like read G.K. Chesterton, for instance, and he'll make commentary upon prohibition in the United States, it just doesn't make any sense to him um, in the way that like a heresy doesn't make any sense to him because it's like, we got hold of a Christian principle and then just drove it bad, like drove it bonkers effectively or drove it mad. Mm. Um, like moderation needs to be achieved and it's risky that one might overindulge. So we're going to ensure underindulgence insofar as it, it cleaves closer to the mean than does the other extreme. So yeah, I don't know if you, you have particular thoughts on that or as it pertains to the conversation about marijuana. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how helpful that is because I would be for a kind of temperance movement yeah, yeah, yeah. against marijuana. And, and, right? Cause I want to draw so, the distinction and yeah. say what's, what's different here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, maybe because when it comes to marijuana, um, I think that what we had 15 years ago before the, the wide legalization or decriminalization that has swept the nation was a better set of circumstances. Um, because we've seen an increase in crime We've seen an increase in driving under the influence now with a different controlled substance, uh, but nevertheless driving under the influence. And then uh, uh, just like a kind of widespread zombification of younger generations who stand to suffer more from it in terms of the, the negative effects that it has on their brain. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is, this is the real crux of the problem. This is the hardest uh, of the objections to those who would argue as we are arguing against its legalization right. or decriminalization. So it's, yeah, we got to grapple with it. Right. Social conservatives are always in every circumstance, always everywhere, all the time, <laughs> right about the slippery slope. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to make it absolutely clear that I completely <laughs> believe that, uh, I used a few words that would indicate that that's an absolute principle. Um, and I, I think we, we certainly see that um, in this case where 
where we see a societal standard that is that is being lowered and it's only going to success to successively be continued continually lowered like it's mm-hmm. not going up um and when when you have something like decriminalization um which is as i already alluded to uh basically a nonsensical distinction from legalization when you have something like decriminalization uh you you begin the erosion for the societal standard i mean we've seen this in marriage um we've We've seen, yeah, name, 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 any, name, any issue, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You've already referenced abortion. Um, but, but when, when we begin to give up, when we begin to look away from the goal, um, or from what the, what the, what the proper desired goods are for a society, you only see erosion. Um, mm-hmm. you, you only see, you only see, um, a decrease yeah, in social mores. So, so for me, I have, I have a lot of objections to, even decriminalization, because I think it initiates a slippery slope that's going to continue to eat away at a general expect at general social expectations. Yeah, what what you said there, it has me thinking that maybe we are remiss to not speak more vehemently and vociferously of the goods of alcohol consumption. Um, not in the sense that we're encouraging people to over imbibe again uh, or to let rip the bacchanalian revels but like okay so so we we mentioned it on a kind of physical level that there are health benefits when you partake of alcohol in moderate fashion um you know so like your doctor might recommend that you have a glass or two of red wine for heart health it's also you know it's associated with the lowering of cholesterol it's associated with with like bone density health it's associated with a variety of different things and that depends of course on the type of alcohol uh that you're partaking of but yeah i mean there are things that have been proven in scientific studies all the way down to like reducing the risk of type two diabetes. Cool. Okay. So, but, but we're not material reductionists. We don't, we don't just leave it there at the physical level. Um, we want to say something more than just, okay, weed and alcohol are different and like this seems worse and this seems to be a part of our culture. So we should defend it, even though we're not entirely sure why I think there are real goods to be had. And I think that people Mm. sense them on a kind of instinctual level. So maybe we can mine some of those. Like what's your experience? Good. So, um, you know, so I mentioned a couple already, right. With alcohol conviviality, right. It'll lighten the mood. You know, people have a drink and they're able to relax. So part of the tension in entering into a social moment is um, is just not knowing how you're going to be received by someone else. It's always a risk yeah, to yeah. put your heart out there to enter into a, a conversation with someone else, and especially if you're in a setting you don't know, uh, where where you don't know a lot of people, where where you don't know um, everything that's at risk in a social engagement. A drink can help uh, yeah, yeah. because it, because it will it will remove those things which inhibit you from revealing who you really are. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that's bad if you're not a virtuous person yeah, yeah. <laughs> because what's going to come out are not virtuous things. But if you're a virtuous person, um, when you let your guard down, people see the good that is in you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so I would say conviviality. Um, another one is, uh, is the, the same effect that people sometimes desire from marijuana use, right? Which is being able to, to relax, um, to, to de-stress a little bit, right? You come up from work, you pour a glass of wine, um, and you're, you're able to, you're able to ease the burdens that you've been carrying from the day, so I so I think that that release of tension is at play, um, which is one, which is one of the things that people desire. Yeah, um, apropos of those two comments, uh, but then kind of pursuing it further, I also think of alcohol consumption, or I associate alcohol consumption with a kind of courage. You know, you think about the man at the party who is inhibited from asking the woman whom he is interested in to go on a date because he's all bound up in himself. (laughs) But after a drink or two, he finds in himself the courage. A little Uh, liquid fortitude. Exactly, yeah. But also like peace, the kind of quieting of one's anxieties uh, in anticipation either of, you know, the evening during which you intend to wind down or something that could potentially be stressful. Uh, so, So we can rely on it too much. We can lean on it as a kind of crutch. But an instance that I think is revelatory of both of these uses or both of these dimensions is that this was told to me by Father Timothy Danaher. I didn't fact check it, but he's a sage man. Um, he said that the Roman legion was typically issued, you know, however many units of wine. I don't know what the measurement was. Let's just say like um, a stomachs. skin. Yeah, exactly. A skin <laughs> of wine a day or something like that. But on, but on days that they were expected to do battle, they were issued two skins of wine. Hmm. And to us, a 21st century audience, it's like, you want them going to battle drunk? No, that's that's not the point. Right. Well, when you think about mm, ancient warfare, the way you won a battle wasn't by total annihilation of the 
you know, the army with whom you were contending. The point was to scare them off the battlefield, to occupy the territory, to utterly convince them that you were superior such that they ceded to your claim. And when you partook of, you know, alcohol in greater abundance, that courage welled up within you and you became the fighting fit legionnaire mm. whom you were born to be mm. and that you could strike terror into the hearts of men who lay on the other side of battle. And I think that there's a sense like, you know, alcohol is supposed to help us come into the fullness of our personality, not to vacate it, but actually to be who we're meant to be. And that doesn't mean that we should rely on it every night to the tune of four drinks so that we can just have a semblance of ourselves. But there's there's a there's a time and a place for it. And this festivity and this relaxation, they all factor in. So I don't know, your thoughts about that. Uh, one thing that's interesting too is, you know, if we're entering a conversation about legalization, we've taken something that was more on the periphery and now we're dealing with something that is that is more central, that's more experienced in everyday life. And again, you know, the pungent odor wafting through our streets is evidence of that. And I think just as an as an observational comment, it's difficult to discuss those things that are present in front of us um, because Im immediately people um, respond as as if condemned or can't imagine can't imagine things other than they are. And so I think part of this reflection about what alcohol does is it it gives it give it allows us to take a step back and to be able to have more freedom to discuss things that that could or should be otherwise than they in fact are around us. Um, I think a lot of times when when we have when we have discussions, thinking through things through both the lens of Catholic moral life or through our desire for a more virtuous republic, uh, you you start immediately saying, well, is it even possible? Is this ever going to be so? And it's important, um, I, I think, to 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 cling to the ideal and to say that this is the goal, and to not to not back down from that, and to find new and clearer ways to articulate it. Yeah, uh, I have one kind of like wrap up thought on that point, and then we can transition to a final segment. Mm. The wrap up thought is that I think in order to grasp this argument, you need to have a little bit of purchase on history and tradition. Right. I li I live with the man, uh, the last place where I was assigned, who is French. And who made the argument that that the vines were planted in southern France in anticipation of the Lord's coming, so that he could make best use of them for the institution of the sacrament of his blood. Um, but there's, you know, while he was being a little bit self-consciously precious, I think that there's a sense to it. Like as Christians, we look to the history of the church, of the church's life as providential, right. and that there's like God takes to hand the things that he intends to use for a plan of redemption. And I think we can say that about wine in a particular way. Like there's a real mysticism that flows from wine in the church because God uses this token of ordinary table fellowship and nourishment to provide us with the divine fellowship and, you know, graced nourishment, which our heart so desperately longs for. Whereas with weed, I think we typically associate it with a kind of pseudo mysticism where spaced out dudes recline on couches and describe the dancing mushroom fairy boot princesses who are like dancing about their heads. You know, it's just like, um, maybe that'd be more like acid, but regardless, um, you, yeah. So that, that'd be like the wrap up thing. And then picking up on kind of how you ended, I think that the, the, the real stakes of, of legalization or decriminalization it's, it's, it's a question of identity. It's a question of who we are as a people and then right. what our mission right. is, you know, so. Right, right, absolutely. So if, we, so if we want to talk about this argument that people are making about legalizing in order to control it, are we, do we really want to say that this is such an important part of who we are and this is such a necessary element to our happiness that, that we have to institutionalize it? Yeah. I'm not willing to say that, yeah. you know, from the, from the, from the get-go. And I already ranted like an angry man with, people on his lawn <laughs> about, about a slippery slope and I'm going to double down on that right now doubling down um down but, doubled but I but I do but I do think that the conversation about legalization again has to take has to take into consideration um the, the ideals what we're striving for as as a common people um and and then to to make clear that people are arguing that they need this thing for the sake of their happiness and to ask questions about that because mm -hmm. So often substances are just used as masks. And no matter how much weed you smoke, you're not going to answer the existential questions that will haunt you. And so until the smoke is cleared, those questions can't be seen for what they are. Boom. Yeah. And when you enshrine it in law, you say something about your happiness as a people. And I don't think like as a people, we want to say that our happiness is bound up or is, is obscured in this cloud. Um, because when you enshrine it in law, you say something about who you are and you say something about how your future generations will come to understand themselves. 
And I think it's better to fight a losing battle than it is to capitulate and find that you've given up on future battles, <laughs> which you never intended to cede. Um, boom. All right. Well, that's the time we have. Um, so any concluding thoughts? Nah, I'm pleased with my last one. I, I am pleased with it too. <laughs> Honestly, I was just asking you that question so that we could agree on the fact that we were both pleased. Um, so turning then to you, uh, the listener, I mean, we've been turned to you for the past 30 minutes, but here we go in a more intentional fashion. Thanks for listening to this episode of God's Planning. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like and subscribe and leave a five-star review. Um, if you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, you can follow the link in the description or in the show notes. In the same uh, description and our show notes, you'll follow links or you'll find links for merchandise and then for upcoming events. Uh, the big upcoming event that we're pumped for uh, at this stage of the game is the Young Adult Retreat, which is to be held at Malvern Retreat House in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Uh, that'd be November 3rd through 5th. So applications are now open. You can find them at godsplanning.org. So we hope to see you there for that weekend. And then something else, not a Godsplanning event, but a Dominican Friars event that we hope to see you for is the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage, which is to take place on September 30th in Washington, D.C., here at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. So it's going to be a big day of preaching and praying the rosary, celebrating the sacred mysteries. Um, yeah, all kinds of fun stuff. I was about to like make a list of a variety of things that start with P, but then it seemed overly precious, and then I forgot what we were doing. So it's going to be preaching and processing and praying and partying, and it's going to be great. So it'll also be an opportunity to meet you. So if we can't meet you at one of these retreats, we'd love to meet you at the Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage. You can find all the details out for that if you just Google Dominican Rosary Pilgrimage. Okay, that's it. Know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on God's Word.